Hello, and welcome to episode 11 of A Trainability Radio, where I have a great conversation with Ken Catchpole about how human factors in healthcare has moved on since he and I first worked together back at Great Ormond Street in 2003. So during this conversation, uh, we're going to talk about uh, particularly the practical aspects of human factors, uh, training and skills and practice for safety in healthcare. All that and much, much more in episode 11 of A Trainability Radio with Ken Catchpole. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing remarkably well. Thank you very much. It's been, it's been years. It's been a long time. <laughs> The move to the US was a was a really good one, you know, because it just sort of expanded the whole world. And and then the move actually to South Carolina has been sort of an extra level up, both in terms of how I've been sort of my engagement with the hospital, which is something I always wanted to do. That you know, one of the frustrations both at Oxford and at GOS and really at Cedars in LA was that hey, they were like, yeah, we'll have human factors, but you stay over there. The hospital here has been really great, and I've also been really lucky in getting some some sort of major grant funding as well which makes me which makes me sort of continue to be employed <laughs> but it's an interesting challenge and and it was something i really you know wanted to talk to you about the challenges and and what if anything has changed in the uh, years since i think was it 2002 when we first met yeah, 2002, 2003. I started at the Grey Ormond Street in 2003, yeah. Oh, 2003, okay. Yeah, and you took over exactly. from Jane Carthy, I think, with right. Mark DeLaval and Co. and Alan Goldman. And, um, it, I, you know, it's what I'm finding is things have moved on in many ways, um, certainly with the subject being discussed. But what I'm not finding is, in many cases, the the acceptance and the embedding of human factors ergonomics principles at the sharp end and I, I I suppose that was one of the things I wanted to know you know have you have you managed that where you are in South Carolina yeah so um it's definitely been interesting sort of watching that develop or, or not and it has developed yeah and I think I'm more positive now about it than than I was five years ago the progress has been frustratingly slow but at the same time certainly here in the US, and we'll talk about this in a minute, is, I think, gathering pace. So, yeah, and I've felt that over the last three or four years. And I'll tell you about sort of some of the, some of the, the outcomes from that. I, I do get the sense in the UK, and of course, it's been a while since, I, you know, I go back to the UK three or, three or four times a year, but I haven't done any work there for a while. I do get the sense that things are moving. I think they're moving much slower. And so my view is that this probably, that the source of this is probably related, and there may be two sources, but it's partly definitely related to the organizations and, and U.S. healthcare organizations and how they're run and, uh, and how they're financed. Yeah. Uh, in that U.S. hospital organizations tend to have a lot more money. They have a lot more administrators, partly just because there's a lot more things to do administratively if you're collecting money off people. But there's also, they tend to have dedicated, you know, departments of multiple, you know, five, 10 people doing quality improvement. And so sort of that when, you know, when human factors is the sort of cherry on top of those things, then if you've only got two people who are sort of doing lean, then there's not much room for a human factors person. But when you've got five, six, seven, eight people doing lean, then actually there's a there's room for a human factors person on top of that. And that's not to say that human factors shouldn't be more central to that, but that's the sort of that's the 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 sort of attitude that there is. That, you know, you've got people doing the work and then you've got sort of patient safety people, uh, and then you've got dedicated quality improvement specialists, and then on top of that you might have your human factors expert um and you know and i think the same goes by the way also for for your particular focus around sort of crm and teamwork training that there's been a far greater emphasis and interest in that in the us than there has been here in the uk and more money to 
to pay for that sort of thing. I also wonder whether there are, I think there might be commercial drivers that help and I don't know, a bunch of maybe organizational drivers that particularly driven, you know, team steps, which is the sort of standard yeah. way of doing. And that's been pushed quite hard by the Agency for Healthcare Quality and Research or the government agency to get involved in that. There isn't, however, centralized incident reporting or centralized approaches to safety or HSIB. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, H- there isn't a sort of equivalent of HSIB. It's more handled at a, at a sort of local level. And do they so, do they share it then, Ken? Do or do people because they tend to be private hospitals? Do they kind of keep it in house and they don't want to talk about it? How does it go on that score? So there's definitely sort of reporting regulatory requirements around certain types of incidents, so never events, and then there's also what do they call them, patient safety organisations, who I think gather together a lot of the incident reports from individual hospitals. But there's definitely a much more commercial sensitivity, which means the sort of openness and availability of that kind of information to, to people sort of outside the, the direct sphere is not, is not as easy to find. But, you know, I think, and I'm not entirely sure how it works, but you don't hear about individual incidents at hospital X, Y, and uh, X, Y, and Z, or X, Y, and Z. But there are sort of mechanisms, regulatory mechanisms, nonetheless, that that look at the you know the gathering incident reports and also look at the sort of frequency of never events. Right. Um, so you know, I, you know, um, and so you know, and there are also lots of sort of specialty databases. Like I think there's I think there's places to report CLABSIs or there's particular. Um, like there's a trauma outcomes database and a cardiac outcomes database. And uh, anyway, there there are sort of all these specialty associated things also. Uh, But do you see those are translating into learning and frontline improvements? um, I'm pleased it made you chuckle. (laughs) Well, no. And then you're then, so then you're into safety science and what do you do with that? So, um, so where I am at my particular organization, we do really well at, I think, not to say it's, you know, there are, there are lots and lots of imperfections, but, uh, you know, lots of things I think we could do better and lots of constraints. But actually, in terms of trying to understand a particular event or set of events and then how that relates to frontline work and how that leads to improvement, the potential value of human factors in that, I've worked at four hospitals and this is, I think, by far the best at doing that. Because I think there's a real, I, I really enjoy, you know, the people I work with, and it, you know, it does come down, down to the people, there's a real emphasis on not blaming, there's a real emphasis on, on actually saying we're really trying to, to think about and work through the issues that we're finding within the constraints that we have. Uh, and, you know, and that's also, that's one of the reasons why I was, attra- you know, I was attracted to move here. And one of the reasons why I think, I think MUIC is quite progressive in that they specifically said we, wanted a, we want a human factors person and not just to do research, but to, to work on our incident analysis or root cause analysis and on the front line, on front line work. So I, I hear I'm involved in all the root cause analysis and so sort of inject my own human factors perspective on, on that. I get involved in a variety of frontline improvement projects that aren't to do with research and won't ever get published but are really cool and also occasionally get asked to do sort of special projects where there's been a particular problem and we'll go in and sort of look at some of these sort of systems approaches. I'm doing some really, really interesting work uh, with the Institute of Psychiatry at the moment, which started off looking at, you know, I started off, I was asked to look at handovers um, and has developed into actually much more looking at a whole range of sort of organizational challenges they've got that are specific to these patients, specific to some of the units I'm working at, some of the bigger challenges associated with psychiatry. So, yeah. Um, can I, can yeah. I just come back on that? I'd, I'd be, one of the things you'd mentioned, handovers in psychiatry, and we've done some work with psychiatry units. And with handovers, I, I, I tend to think of it as being situation awareness of the patient. So are they progressing or, you know, is the treatment having the effect? And that sometimes you find the one that then 
ends up in a, a tragic situation, maybe committing suicide, is often the one that's kind of gone off the gone off the radar. So someone they've lost sight of because they appear to be okay. And actually, when you look back at it, maybe the telltale signs were there that they weren't progressing. They were going back into deep clinical depression or something. Is that something you found? Or? Yeah, yeah. So that you know that that that's obviously a feature of this. You know, it's it's sort of easy to say in hindsight that oh well, we missed these these features. And actually, it's 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 incredibly difficult to to prevent all of those instances. Of course, um, yes. You know, the, and you have it both ways. You do have people who who say they are, are so desperate sort of to get out of their social situation that they'll say they're suicidal to get admitted, as well as people right. who will say they're fine only to get so that they can get released so that they can complete on their, uh, on their suicidal ideation. So these are, you know, which is that, which is why I, uh, certainly I feel that I think with a lot of psych- psych- psychiatry sort of safety challenges that they are, they're all the same safety challenges we get in traditional clinical work, but much, much greater because of the involvement of the patient. And this goes for also things like elopement, um, that when you've got people who are supposed to be sort of committed, then obviously patients leaving against medical advice, AMA, is a, is a is a sort of safety problem for everyone. But actually, it's particularly for problem for elopement, because patients will sometimes these patients will be looking for opportunities where there's some other thing going on, whether they can elope uh, and you know, get out of the, the, site of the institute while something else, while everyone else is distracted. So you, you don't get that with you, or that, that sort of situation isn't, you don't get that in a sort of traditional patient safety clinical environment where right. patients, yeah. So anyway, so the, that's so can I, I can I just clarify? I didn't talk about any of that, but that, that's you know those are some of the interesting features. Okay. So just to, just to clarify, because elopement is not a, a word I've heard before. Does that mean like escaping the system? Is that is that what I mean, that means? Got, if you've got somebody who's who might have be there, you know, who's sort of committed or is there so you know, sectioned in this country? Good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sectioned. They're supposed to be we pre- prevent them from leaving, and that might be because they got su- suicidal ideation, or it right. might be that they might be a harm to other people uh, of various sorts. And so, yeah, that it's not just about sort of slipping through the cracks, which happens that oh, we missed this patient who, was, but it's actually that they're waiting for the moment for an opportunity to take advantage of other systems problems. Escape. So it sort of exacerbates systems problems already. Anyway, yeah, I didn't sort of deliberately mean to talk about that, but that's you know that's something that I've been really interested in and working with people and trying to trying to work through right. How do you? What's the best approach to this? So in terms of sort of uh, suicide, suicidal ideation, sort of, you know protection of that, and you know with the with the danger of completion, it seems to me that the things that there are things that you have to do. You know, you can't always stop people completing on their suicidal ideation, but there are things you can do to understand when it's appropriate to discharge somebody and then have appropriate follow-up and appropriate social support and all these sorts of different things. And if you've got, you know, if you've got, if you've done the best you can and you still have a completion on that, then maybe there's nothing we can do about that. But actually, and it's been reassuring that, in some of those situations that we've sort of done a root cause analysis and actually found, well, no, we did all we could in this case. Right. So many times, as you say, somebody's not aware that the signs were there or, you know, or that we didn't do the follow-up or they didn't, they weren't discharged with somebody who was going to look after them or in a social situation that was, that was going to be good for them. And, and, you know, we've done root cause analysis where we've done all of those things and we've gone through it and still found that the patient has, you know, that there might have been a bad outcome. You know, that, then I think we've done all we can. And, okay. you know, and that, that's a sort of relief. Sorry, go on. Yeah. No, I was only going to say, it sounds very interesting because I, I wondered where you were in terms of the sort of the theoretical, the academic side and the practical. And it sounds like you're very much at the practical level, which personally, you know, with my interest in, in, in trying to deal with non-technical skills and things is, is very much where I'm focused. So I, I'm, it wasn't quite what I was expecting, I, I suppose. <laughs> That's right. I, I'm lucky in that I, I think it's important to do both. And, you know, so this sort of leads, so that work is obviously leading to thoughts about, right, how do we, how do we you know, research is obviously thinking about long-term 
And so how do we, you know, and so there are short term things. Have we done all we can? Are there systems that we need to put in place now versus, you know, what are the larger problems here that we need to understand in more detail? Mm. So another thing I've been involved with, you know, is, is how we think about retained foreign objects in after surgery. There might be immediate solutions, but actually in, in looking at some of those sort of immediate solutions, it's we found, oh, there's a great, yeah, we did this. We, we, we actually just had a study. We completed some studies looking at sterile processing. So the, the reprocessing of uh, surgical instruments. And we found when we looked at, you know, when we looked at the research that nobody had actually ever looked at how, or there are very, very few papers on how we do this in a safe way. Thousands of papers on healthcare associated infections, very little on the infections that we might get from surgical instruments. Oh. So that immediately led us to think, well, this is a whole area of research that we need to explore. We need to look at the processes by which this is happening. We need to look at the people who are doing it. We need to look at what they're doing. We need to look at all the things that affect the performance outcomes that can end up with you having a dirty instrument or a broken instrument or a missing instrument turn up back in the operating room, which is pretty frequent, actually. They understand that the one in 10 surgeries has, has equipment either missing, broken, or with, still with bio burden on. So sterile, but not necessarily cleaned. Yeah. So big, big issue. So the sort of working, so that came out of an operational concern. Uh, we went down and looked at it. We thought, oh, okay, there's a, actually we need to, there's a whole system here that nobody's really thought about. This is something that we can combine sort of research and improvement and practice at the same time. So that's how the model works. We're doing the same thing, retain, retain foreign objects. In, in exploring that, actually, it strikes me that, that the focus of that is on the surgical count, which is only a very, very, very small component of, of what we need to do to reduce the incidence of retained foreign objects. And the fact that we still have retained foreign objects and we rely on this, you know, this one and actually fairly brittle process, which, by the way, as soon as you start looking at it, is really not as clear or as straightforward as you might have thought, means that, yes, there are things that we can do now to improve the people doing the work and the systems doing the work now, but actually a whole, whole looking at the whole system and saying, in, in classic terms, how do we avoid these situations how do we trap them as they're happening as we mitigate, you know, which is back to some of the things that we used to talk about. Threat and error management, yeah, yeah. That's right. Uh, that actually all counting is doing is trapping. It's all it's saying is we've, yeah. we've got an instrument missing. But how can we avoid the instruments missing in the first place? And what do we do in mitigation afterwards that will stop us, stop patients either... Um, Sent to recovery or whatever. Yeah. Home with these things in. Yeah. So that actually gives us a whole, there's a whole bunch of things that we can do that we're not even thinking about, which is, by the way, why retained foreign objects are still a thing. Because nobody, because as far as I know, nobody's looked, about, looked, at, looked at it in this sort of broader systems way in thinking about avoiding traffic, mitigating, and all the ways in which it does and doesn't work. But really, as you say, the trick comes down to how to avoid it in the first place, because mitigation is post hoc. Trapping is in the moment, but the avoiding is trying to sort it out before it even happens. And really, by, by appropriate, I would say, wouldn't I, non-technical skills and, and <laughs> um, well, but assertiveness and things. So, you know, it, it's escalation and assertiveness and, um, and dealing with an appropriate hierarchy and unprofessional behavior which is one component of it, but it's not nearly the whole story. No, no, um, of course. So for example, what goes in and what comes out is, you know, what you count and what you don't varies between different sorts of surgeries. But, um, you know, if you, have an, if you have a pediatric case with uh, an, inc an incision that's an inch long, do you need to be counting instruments that are three or four or five inches long that couldn't possibly be stored in the cavity? Well, and, and do people understand? And, and okay, so here's another example. Surgical marking. So you might have a surgeon who will use a pen. They'll take the lid off. They'll make a little mark. <laughs> yeah. And then what do you do with the lid? Do you count the lid or don't you? Does the lid go on a count sheet or does it not? So actually, we're also reliant. So this is where we can't manage the system through rules. That we do, we need to provide a structure for this to be 
done in the best way, but then we also need to rely on staff at the front end, which is, you know, which does relate somewhat something to long technical skills, but also to other things as well. But, you know, we got to rely on staff to be aware of the safety issues associated with, oh, look, there's a loose pen lid. We need to keep an eye on that pen lid so that it doesn't end up in the patient because we're not counting it because we can't count. You know, we can't yeah. put everything or have a procedure or process for everything. Well, wouldn't you, wouldn't you, though, ergonomically design a pen with a retractable writing? Well, there you go. With no lid, in other words. So that's your ergonomics. Exactly. No, and another little idea is, you know, you, you ski, don't you? Uh, I have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know that if you ski in powder, to, uh, so that if you, if you lose your skis in powder, you would put long streamers on your skis that will unfurl if yep. they come off. Yep. So, so we could probably do that with certain instruments that went into the body cavity that were attached to a streamer so that we could see, oh, look, that's still hanging out the body cavity. We know it's there. Then we're not reliant on the count itself. The count just becomes a confirmation, not a... Uh, and so, you know, there's tons of things that we could think about that go beyond one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, which is not very reliable anyway. If you've ever tried to account 100 coins, then, you know, there are all sorts of ways we could think about doing that in different ways, designing exactly having pens that where the lid, you know, don't have a lid or the lid doesn't come off. There will always be ways in which people try to adapt the work anyway. Um, it's an interesting thing, though, because I've listened to some, you know, very eminent ergonomists who tell me that they can design a totally safe system. And I think, well, that's fine. But in the meantime, you know, we've got today and tomorrow to get through. And a lot of the things I heard, for instance, a talk this um, in the last six months or so by the HSIB, the, the Healthcare mm-hmm. Service uh, Safety in- Investigation Branch, where they were saying that the problems they'd found in maternity were really fundamentally behavioral. You know, they, they weren't design problems. It was about people, for instance, not recognizing a deteriorating uh, fetal heart monitor, a cardiotocograph, and, and then not escalating it appropriately for whatever reason. And um, I, I wondered if you'd come across much of that. So um, es- uh, failure to escalate is, is, always a, is always an issue. And to only see it as behavioral uh, is to only see the symptoms. Yeah. Yeah, what is the problem? Um, so, no, is the idea that the, no, the idea that maternal care is, is, is all about behavioral problems is, is absolutely failing to, uh, to understand. Or rather, the human factors, sorry, the, the, the sort of human factors engineering perspective would say behavior arises from the, the design of the system. And so um, if, you, if you want to change behavior, then good luck with that. If you want to change the system, then that will lead to the behavioral changes that you want to see. So in terms of stuff like escalation, there's, you've got to look at why people don't escalate. Yeah. And there are all sorts of reasons, and you know, there's some, some research on this. There are all sorts of reasons why people don't escalate. So one way to look at it is, is in terms of you know, what I call signal detection theory, hits, misses, false alarms, correct rejections. So the point at which you decide to escalate, the decisions that people make on that is going to be a risk-benefit decision. So if I think that if I raise the alarm about patient deterioration or sepsis or fetal heart monitoring, if I raise the alarm too early, and then uh, the physician turns up and shouts at me, the next time I'm not going to do that. I'm going to yeah. wait until the patient's really sick. So with a system that's, that's not perfect, you're going to have false alarms. If you have less false alarms, then you're going to have less hits. So you're, if you want to have a system that has less false alarms, the system that also fails to capture all the patients. One of the natures of a es- system of escalation is if you want it to be effective, you have to have a number, presumably a relatively high number of false alarms. Now, what happens when you have a ton of false alarms is people start saying, ah, oh, well, we're going to all these escalation events, whether, you know, whatever, patient deterioration, and it's a waste of our time, and it's a waste of our money, 
And that's when the sort of bean counters come in and say, well, we're wasting all this time going to escalation events that we don't need. We should be doing less of that. You do less of that. And then you have patients who you then don't identify as being sick when they actually are sick. So ultimately, safety is never about behavior alone. It's always about the trade-off, always about the trade-off between throughput, the number of patients I've got to deal with, cost, and quality and safety. It's always at that, and, and people right across an organization are always making those judgments all the time. Should yeah. I take longer over this um, and do it better? Or should I do it faster so I can do it more efficiently and get more patients through? So when you have very clear targets for efficiency and for throughput, but your sort of approach to safety is a little bit difficult because it is difficult to measure, then people will trade, that people will do things faster and cheaper um, with the consequent increase in, in safety-related events. And that's what you see. And, and that's a universal pre- By the way, if anyone says you can have a safe system, there's only one way in which you have a safe <laughs> hospital. You know what, do you know, know, what, know what the way to have a safe hospital is? Take the people out. Exactly, lock the doors. <laughs> the only way you're going to have a safe system. And the whole thing about healthcare or, you know, or aviation is we're trading a short-term higher risk yeah. for a longer-term benefit. Yeah. So surgery is all about, no, of course it's not safe to open, open somebody up. It's not safe. It carries with it far more risks than if you don't open somebody up. But the argument with, you know, the reason why we do surgery is because that's a short-term risk that we think is manageable, that we need to trade off for a longer-term benefit that it's going to give this patient better quality of life or better longevity. Yeah, I think I definitely agree with that. Um, here's a question for you. Something we come up against a lot is the, the famous five steps to safer surgery, for instance. So brief, three stages of the checklist, debrief. We can get people to brief. We struggle to get them to do checklists effectively, and sometimes they tick boxes because they tick the box without doing the check. Debrief is something which we still struggle with, particularly when nothing's gone wrong and things have gone right. Um, and even so, debriefing without undue blame. Have you, have you got any lessons on that, Ken, or any experience on that? No, um, let me see. So, <laughs> oh, no. um, I think this is right. Let, you know, let's, I think that's a really good thing to think about. Um, so, um, yeah, because, you know, I, I, I learned a lot from working with you about, about debriefings and, and, and their importance. And I think, you know, since way back in whatever, 2003, four, five, been trying to, you know, been, been really sort of of the view that, of how important debriefing is. And I'm also really glad that you guys and there are, you know, lots of sort of people with expert, expertise in this trying to do this really well, because I think it's really important, but really tough to do. It's, and I don't, so it's definitely not, you know, I, I sort of moved away from the teamwork and you know briefing and debriefing stuff you know for my own i guess because i i wanted to sort of explore wider systems perspectives which is immensely I'm really valuable let me say doing, I'm, really, yeah. I'm really glad that we're still doing it but no i think that that's a really that's one of the really really tough things to do yeah um, and it's partly i think and you know we could think about and you could probably tell me more about this than than i know but the sorts of things that you know uh, the, the sorts of challenges you have is particularly after, for example, surgery, everyone just disappears and people disappear at different times and yep. everyone wants to go home at the end of the day. And, you know, between surgery one and surgery two, the anesthesiologist, the anesthetist is disappearing to, to get the next patient through. And there are all these production pressures. And, uh, you know, obviously, if OR utilization, which was a whole thing, uh, if, OR, if you want to have high OR utilization, then that's in direct conflict with doing a debrief. Yeah. Uh, now, of course, it doesn't mean that a debrief needs to be long, but a two-minute debrief, you know, you can get a whole ton of things done in two minutes or five minutes, which yeah. doesn't necessarily impact on the bottom line of the sort of OR utilization performance measures. But at the same time, 
people don't want to do it because they feel under pressure because the thing that they're really, and again, it's back to the, it's cost, throughput and safety. OR utilization measures, easily measurable. They're usually sort of, there's usually a lot of effort placed in, or at least when I was in the UK, there was a lot of effort placed on trying to improve them. One of which is that we're going to it directly discourage briefings. Well, it's interesting you say the two-minute debrief because that's what we suggest is just three questions. What's one thing we did well or I did well? Uh, is there one thing we could do more of? Is there one thing we could do less of? And, of course, the magic word, which people don't seem to get, is could. Not should, not ought, which is telling you what to do, but could, which is actually treating you like an adult. And, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of teamwork is around very parental. It's, it's telling people what they ought or should do. And people don't like that. And that's, but the other side of it is people don't accept praise. And because people don't accept, particularly in healthcare, they just do the shrug, you know, just doing my job. Great working with you today, Ken, oh, just doing my job. And they kind of shrug it off. And by the time you've said to me two or three, four times that you're just doing your job, well, why would I bother to give you praise? Because you don't accept it and you just give up. And that now becomes part of the, I, I would rather call it the climate rather than the other word beginning with C. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, very yeah. contentious, of course. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, it's, um, it, it's, so one thing I say to people is be kinder to yourself and also be kinder to your colleagues. So compassion is not just aimed at the, at the patient, which, of course, it should be. You know, if, if you take success for granted, you're wasting such a learning opportunity, it seems to me. I don't, you know, what do you think yeah, that? no, and of course, as you know, in, in you know, within... Um, to take it back to sort of theoretical human factors, what we're finding, you know, and what the sort of progress of the last, I guess, 20 years in understanding safety and safety science is actually not to say we did something bad, but actually to say the things that we, when things go wrong, they're exactly the same things that we're doing as when they do well. So actually, rather mm-hmm. than saying, oh, we need to do an analysis because we did something bad, actually, the important thing about safety at work is becoming more about what do we do well? And let's do more of that. And so yeah. by doing more of the things we do well and understanding why we do them well, and that's actually the key, is yeah. it's so difficult when things go well, it's much more difficult to see why it went well because when things go wrong, you'd say, well, we did that wrong. Well, it's not as easy to see when things go well. But the point is, if you can work out how things go well, then you, and then you can focus on doing more of that and that will actually make you more efficient it will give you better throughput and you'll be safer. But it's not, it becomes not a tra- not, no, not so much a trade off and more about getting better all the time. And so, yeah, that's the idea. And that's one of the thing, wonderful things that about that you can do with briefing. It's not like, well, you know, who did what wrong and who do, who need, who do we need to tell to do something different next time? It's actually, hey, what do we do well and why did that work well? And let's make sure that we keep on doing that, and do more of that. That's a more difficult thing, actually, I think, particularly in British culture, to sort of recognise. There is a certain, you know, it, it, it may be cliche, but I think that there is a certain, a certain amount of... Anyway, it, it, it's sort of, it's a little bit easier to, to, to give praise and accept praise. On um, your side of the Atlantic. In the US, and it is, yeah. yeah. Um, maybe, you know, we, we have most of the same problems being able to do it, of, of it being relevant, of people having the skills to be able to do it, you know, and then you're into, you know, well, how do we sort of record this over time? How do we, uh, you know, what's the organizational memory here, you know, and, and all those sorts of things. Um, well, I was delighted to yesterday be, be part of a, I better not say who, but a, a private healthcare um, multi-hospital organization over here. And we were um, at the uh, Safety Guardian, Safety Champions conference in-house talking about how we can help them to, you know, to learn from excellence and to plant people with more knowledge of human factors ergonomics within the organization, within the frontline teams. And of course, they'll do that bit of supporting their colleagues and also supporting management. And, yeah. um, but the point being for me, like we, one of the lessons we learned back in aviation all those years ago was you've got to select them. Just take the the people who are willing volunteers. They may not, they may, but they may not have the credibility with their colleagues 
And they, they have, of course, to be able to walk the talk because yeah. there are plenty of people who can talk the talk, but actually they can't translate it into their own behavior. So it, it's all chin music, if you like. You know, it's all the, the lips are moving, but, the, but the, nothing else matches. Do as I do, as I do, not do as I say. And people who are enthusiastic and not necessarily, as you say, not necessarily the opinion leaders. Sometimes it's really helpful to have negative people who will tell you things that you didn't realize you know, that you needed to know. Well, it's like Jahari's window, isn't it? You know, the stuff that's blind to you, that, or, you know, yeah. uh, and which, uh, which we still use. And, um, and yes, that's, that's... Jahari's window, that's interesting. Yeah, I don't know the phrase of that. I should, you know, look that up. Um, well, it's, it's yeah, one of the, you know, one of the flat, classic foundations. It's all about feedback, isn't it? You know, you will know things about me uh, that I don't know. And, and that's where the really valuable feedback is, that, that you give me that stuff that, to which I'm, I'm just, yeah. I'm not aware. Yeah, and, in, and it so, could be painful. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So circle back a little bit to where we started with one of the things I've been that's happened to, to pick up on that and what you said about embedded uh, human factors. There's there's no question for me, and you know, my the best way to apply human factors in in clinical environments is to stick very very close to the clinicians doing the work, which is why I've always been based at hospitals. I've been lucky in that I've, I'm also I also have a very successful academic career. I would probably have a more successful academic career if if I was only interested in papers and grants if I was based at a university. But I would be a long way from the clinical uh, or, or sort of classic within a classic university department. I am I am in a university, but I'm not in a human factors or engineering department. I'm in a department of anesthesia because the people I work with are surgeons and you know anesthesiologists and nurses. So um, I'm very much of the view that that you can't come in to a you know uh, uh, you, you can't do good systems level human factors by coming in from a sort of ivory tower and telling people what they should or shouldn't be doing that actually for me it's a you know uh, it's so important to be there to be working alongside people and by the way by doing that i it's 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 great productively academically because it's generated all sorts of fantastic you know research papers and grants um, but also it means that you're not just writing papers and getting grants, but those things are leading to changes within the organization. And the thing that's happened over the last five years, I'd say, in the US, is that there's been this realization, particularly in children's hospitals, that having a qualified human factors practitioner working with them, not with research, but actually at the front line as part of a quality improvement team or part of a safety team, um, or indeed in some cases, leading quality improvement and safety, is a really, really good thing. Uh, and so we've seen uh, quite a, a rapid rise in, the, in people being employed with human factors expertise within clinical systems. So to the point, you know, which was so nice to finally see, and then I started to meet people doing this. We all had these shared experiences of, of how human factors looks when you're looking in from outside versus how you actually practice it in clinical care, work with physicians or, or clinicians or nurses who might have a small amount of human factors, they might, might know a little bit around CRM or they might know sort of checklists, but actually don't necessarily have the whole picture and how you can yeah. work with them, how you can work with quality improvement people who, you know, Lean and Six Sigma, it's great. It's, you know, it's great for what it does. It doesn't cover everything, but what it does, I've learned a ton about um, how to make change. And so as a result, we realized that in order to be successful moving forward, and the fact, for example, that we're all looking at the same problems, we're all looking at handovers, we're all looking at clabsies, we're all looking at, um, at uh, failure to escalate or sepsis, we're all looking at those things. And they're all slightly different in different hospitals, but they've all got a lot of the similar features and that we can learn from each other about and support each other in doing that so to do to really to to do that we put together this professional network which is for people who are doing this work um, it's called the uh, human factors transforming health network uh, and we're trying to build a network of people who are doing this embedded clinical human factors work working alongside clinicians on all these different safety related problems applying sort of systems uh, system safety theory, safety two, maybe a little bit of CRM, usability, 
you know, systems redesign, task analysis, all the sort of standard human factors techniques, and, um, you know, root cause analysis, uh, axiom maps, all that kind of stuff to try and get some traction and really to make a difference um, to uh, use human factors yeah. techniques to make a difference to, to people's lives. And it seems to be, uh, and, and it seems to be working, it's growing. And that's what I feel most, conf- most happy about. And after 17 years, I'm glad that it's about time we're, we're, <laughs> we're moving forward. Um, and so that feels really good. And, and I think that's really exciting. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to say I applied to join and I've been accepted. To join your human factors transforming healthcare That's network great. so uh, if people want to look at it, it it's uh, it's the i'll put a plug-in for you here on the podcast uh, Ken. it's the <laughs> hfthnetwork.org so yeah. hfthnetwork.org and, and the, um i, I really yeah. applaud you i think it's a fantastic thing to do and uh i'm looking forward yeah. i hope to be able to contribute as well as um has, has used the resources but I, you know for me the practical side has always been the main part I've always you know the theory is great but I my whole bent has always been at the sharp end you know that, that's great but so what 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 do we do now with it and um, I, I absolutely agree with that and I think that's yeah yeah uh, and, and and you know it's it's sort of about it's also about and then I think you're you, you sort of got what we call a champion so you're somebody who champions the idea of human factors you're not necessarily embedded and you've got a particular mm. area of expertise but you're you're working uh, and there's a lot of there's a lot of low overlap and and, and, yeah. and synergy with what we do another thing of another aim is also to to help clinicians understand you know human factors what it is to help them do the human factors that they can do but also to help them understand when it might be appropriate to call in an expert in CRM yeah. or in cost analysis or in safety two or any of those or incident analysis or usability or any of those things. So, um, so yeah, I think that that's, that's really exciting. We don't quite know what, how that's going to work. And <laughs> I think, you know, we're actually meeting in two weeks time to say, right, what's next? How do we, what sort of activities do we want to do? How do we, once we, we've had this network, what do we do with it? But I think we're going to have, resources and we're going to have meetings and we're going to have all these things but you know we're it's still in the early days and um, sharing best practice is where you really want to go yeah. and and the positive stuff and just i think we're going to, have to knock this on the head because we've been going nearly an hour did you know that and um we're, we're now just starting work hopefully the the, the current virus thing has has kind of sucked yep. up the excess funds but we're we hope about to start work with a particular nhs trust quality improvement team who uh, they're good at QI, but their their QI lead has realized that what they, although they're very interested in HF, they thought, well, I can read about it, but I don't really get it. So they contacted me and us to to come along and help them embed it and get what their aim is to get every member of staff, and there's 5,000 odd of them, they said to, to think beyond, you know, to think improvement and to understand the human element. As one of my more cynical colleagues said, yeah, okay, but are they listening? Well, I think they are. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I really hope we can make them make a practical difference. Or, you know, that, that would yeah. be the, the icing on the cake. Yeah. Um, I, you know, yes, we do have to go. I, I, have, I had a conversation. I remember, you know, way back in Grey Ormond Street days where we had a conversation about how hard it was to do this mm. and how we could see the things that, that could be done and might be done um, but how hard it was to actually do them and how, yeah. and yeah, I think that what we both would probably agree is that, that we're, we're making progress. The progress is small, but we are moving forward. If this was easy, it would have been solved. Yeah. But it, the fact is that I think that, you know, and so it's so nice to see you and talk after, after all these years to see there's some of the same old problems, but also we are making progress and there are, small gains that have been made and you know and i and i think that's that's all that we can ask you know yep. to be effective and to, to to be able to make make small differences um where we can yes i, I agree but i i am i must say frustrated sometimes by there's an awful, <laughs> well a part of it is there's a lot of people think they can sheep dip their staff through human factors understanding and you yep. just can't you know when yep. i first started in about 1990 or 91 in the airline business 
It's now in 2020. I'm still learning, Ken, and I, I bet you are too. And you've been going, you know, Absolutely. since the early yes. 2000s at least in healthcare. You know, I'm still learning, which is delightful. But people think they've got it after like, you know, two or three hours in the classroom. You've yes. got to be kidding. <laughs> well, just, yeah, exactly. You know, and, and all we can do, I think, is help those people on their journey. Healthcare is, is its own thing. And it's so good to be involved in it. It's, it uh, is. And, and to try and keep away from it as a patient. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, should we wrap this up for now? I mean, maybe yeah. we could do this again sometime. I'd love to do it again. Yeah. And um, really we've nice got more time. It's been really nice to catch up and really nice it's, to see. Um, I'm very grateful for your time, Ken, because I, I'm, 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 it's, it's always been a pleasure to know you and to be around you. You've always made me think and think a bit differently oh. and, and um, challenged my, some of my ways of thinking, which is great. I, I really value that. And, well, um, I've learned, you know, I learned, uh, I learned a lot from, I've learned a lot from you uh, with, you know, with what you do. And, and I genuinely mean it when I say, you know, we need people who, who specialize in what you do. And, and thank you for sticking at it. Well, it's very kind of you. <laughs> uh, I think we're I think mutual, um, mutual uh, admiration society, but quite rightly, I think you, you know, you've done a lot of work and the original work we did was, was fascinating. We we didn't always see eye to eye on what we were trying to achieve, but, but that's okay. Yeah, yeah. that's all right. Um, we should talk about the fact that that not always seeing eye to eye is a really important thing in a team. I, I think to challenge and to challenge as friends is uh, is a very important aspect. <laughs> and uh, there you go. So that was a great pleasure, and I'm very grateful to Ken Ken Catchpole appearing as a guest on a Trainability Radio. And I hope that conversation gives you plenty to think about human factors in healthcare and perhaps beyond. You can find the show notes for this episode of Trainability Radio at www.trainability.co.uk. Just search for episode 11 with Ken Catchpole. And within those show notes, you can find links and other useful resources. Please do help to spread the word about a Trainability Radio. Tell a friend about the show, uh, colleagues, and if you've not already done so, you can subscribe to this podcast in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. So until next time, thanks for listening. I have been and I remain Trevor Dale, and this has been a Trainability Radio.